Today, I'm joined by Ed Dutton. Ed is a professor of evolutionary psychology. He's also a, uh, in a way, a science communicator, um, and he has a very, very uh, entertaining and informative YouTube channel called the the Jolly Heretic, uh, where I know his work from. Um, welcome, welcome, Edward. Well, hello, hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's it's lovely to have you on. I've been enjoying your your content. Um, it's uh, you, you have a, a very specific style, and you also have a very specific area of expertise. Uh, one that is, uh, you know, as as the the name implies, quite heretical. Uh, you look at genetics, uh, and especially at genetics <laughs> from an angle that people typically shy away from. So you look at the genetics of uh, sex differences, um, IQ, race, uh, other other you know dark spots on on the map yes. of uh, science. Yes, I do. I do. I, t I take I take the view that if you have people uh, dogmatically telling you that you definitely shouldn't look at something, then that's like that, that makes me want to look at it. I mean, because the very fact that they're telling you that you absolutely shouldn't look at it, don't go there, tells me that there's um, there's something they have to hide, uh, that, that they, they, they harbour secret doubts, uh, and that therefore that's where the truth is. And so unfortunately, uh, myself and people like me find myself attracted to the very things they tell us not to be attracted to. And that's uh, at the moment race differences, sex differences, increasingly transsexuality, um, and uh, these kinds of areas. Yes, I mean, I I can I can understand that feeling. I think you know, partly the the, the purpose for of, for this podcast is to to talk to people like you and to explore these areas. Uh, and that's why I titled Subversive. I hope I'm I'm living up to the promise of the name. Um, but do you think that there are truths that are worth suppressing for the sake of social stability or for any other pro-social uh, purpose? Um. Personally, uh, um, I, there, there may be, but that's not what I don't care. Um, <laughs> I, 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 a, a society is made up of different kinds of people. Uh, a society functions uh, better than another society if it has the optimum numbers of the, the right kinds of people. And the kind of person I am is the person that's particularly interested in the truth. And whether certain truths should be suppressed, I would say probably overall not. For example, you could argue that if you suppress uh, if, if you suppress race differences, that's a good thing. If you suppress the existence of race differences, because it, um, it means that people don't discriminate against each other, and it means that people treat people as individuals. If you regard that as inherently good, uh, and it means that it, you're less likely to get I don't know racial discord or something like that. But on the other hand, you could argue that it's a problem because if you suppress the existence of these differences, then we're left wondering why is it that even if you give people equal opportunity, you still end up with racial differences in achievement. And moreover, if you if you suppress these differences, then you have to suppress things like the uh, different dosages of different medicines are needed for different races or that uh, different races will react differently to organs from different races uh, or, or will, require, will have different health problems or, 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 or whatever. And also, if you build a society based around a series of lies, then eventually I take the view that the truth will out um, and that truth will be attracted attractive to sort of psychopaths and extremists with nothing to lose and um and, and it will out with, with them rather than out calmly so i think you could argue it on both sides so uh, as a rule i would say no i don't believe in plato's great lie mm -hmm. um i feel like there's um there's there's quite a lot of that going around i think that's you know partly why, why we're on the internet why we're discussing these things because we're not supposed to be um and i feel like there's a there's quite a, a bit of difference in and how uh the the gender issues is treated now so you know the, the the different sex differences differences between men and women because that's kind of the the core of what's happening in the west obviously in america race differences are quite a more heated topic but i feel like in europe uh gender differences are becoming even more you know salient and uh, we've kind of had a, a way to handle these things in eastern europe <laughs> but now by uh becoming part of europe by becoming part of europe proper the european union we have to deal with these uh with kind of this gender uh, in individualistic effect where you you have to you know women have to become <clears throat> sort of uh you know producer consumers like like the men uh and we're not doing exactly a a great job at it and there's a little bit of conflict arising from that as well so 
Um, I mean, you you mentioned that you're you're writing a book on on feminism. I'm curious if there's um, if, if kind of what what the premise of that is and how you're um, how you're kind of broaching this this subject. I know you've talked about this in the past, but uh, what uh, the book is called "Which is Feminism and the Fall of the West," and <laughs> it uh, looks at how basically witches are real. They were real, and what they were was proto feminists. So what you have with a, a feminist woman is basically a masculinized woman who is manlike and who is not submissive to the patriarchy. Um, and in days of yore, when they had witches, those kinds of women would tend to manifest at the bottom of society as antisocial, unpleasant uh, spinsters who would upset everybody. And uh, though, and they would also practice their own sort of folk magic and things like this that was independent of the church. And those were the kinds of people that were accused of witchcraft. And now, for various reasons, those people manifest in the middle of society and they espouse feminist values there and they push the whole society in a maladaptive direction. And that's that's basically it. So in the old days, we had these people, we had a society that was under harsh Darwinian selection pressure. And uh, this meant that you had harsh group selection. Uh, you can see this across Eastern Europe with the battles that the Eastern Europeans had against the Muslims, taking them as slaves and things like that, you know, in, your, in Eastern Europe and the, the Ottoman Empire and so on. You had group selection and the group that overall was that was more likely to dominate was the group that was high in positive ethnocentrism and high in negative ethnocentrism. So high in in-group cooperation and out-group hostility. One of the things that elevated uh, in-group cooperation was patriarchy, because um, you, in order to, f for, for, um, to have stable families, you have to get the men to invest in the children and in the wives, uh, and they're more likely to do this if they have some kind of control of the females. Otherwise, they'll be fighting with each other all the time and jealous of each other. So therefore, patriarchy comes about as a result of the female desire for investment. In a sense, females bring about patriarchy. Therefore, patriarchy becomes ad adaptive for the society. The society that's higher in patriarchy will be higher in ethnocentrism, and therefore it becomes promoted as the will of God, as, as part of the religion, and it goes together with the religiosity. And therefore, you have selection for patriarchy. Females who are submissive to the patriarchy will literally be selected for the men will want men, women that are submissive to the patriarchy, because then they can guarantee they won't be cuckolded. And then all this will become selected for together with other things that we would have been selected for under harsh Darwinian conditions. They bundle together. So we're selected for group orientation, for, we're selected for religiousness, because religiousness tends to elevate uh, uh, pro-social values and make us not become depressed and... Um, and make basically uh, adaptive things into the will of God. We're selected for intelligence. We're selected for ment genetic mental health. We're selected for genetic physical health. And all of these things sort of bundle together and are being selected for over time. And we're becoming higher and higher and higher in them over time. Now, what the child mortality rate was 50% uh, uh, or something like that. Um, that meant that uh, half of, of children would not reach adulthood. On average, it might have been as little as between 30 and 10 percent of people that actually passed on their genes. Um, and so there was this very, very so uh, strong and intense selection pressure. And what you get is, a, um, and it's a simple fact, the brain is 84 percent of the genome, which means it's a huge target for mutation. So if you've got mutation of the mind, which makes you deviate from this group selected uh, a bundle that we're all selected for, so it makes you more individualistic and selfish and nasty and antisocial and whatever, then you're going to have mutation of the body. And this is why uh, <clears throat> even now mutations of the, of the body, of the, of the mind, depression and autism and low IQ and all these kinds of things go together with being physically unattractive. So what you had in witches, right at the bottom of society, were these women who were individualists, who were anti-feminist, who were nasty, aggressive, this is documented, aggressive, sociosexual, unpleasant, physically unattractive sort of people. That's what witches were. And that's what feminists are now. And if you look at the data on feminists, they are masculinized, 
um, compared to normal women. So they're physically more masculinized. They're higher in testosterone. They're more aggressive. They're more sociosexual. They're interestingly more likely to have rape fantasies than non-feminist identifying women, which tells you something about the kind of people that they are. Um, they're, they're, they are individualists adapted to an uncooperative society of live fast, die young selfishness. That's what feminists are. And the old days we had women like that, they were called witches. They were damaging to the group. They spread disorder through the group. And so in times of intense Darwinian selection pressure, when there wasn't enough food and whatever, people like that were, uh, it was adaptive for people like that to be accused of witchcraft, for it to be religiously sanctioned to get rid of them, because they drove the community in a suboptimally adaptive direction. That's what witches were. And <laughs> my argument in the book is, well, with the breakdown of Darwinian selection pressures in in 1800 or whatever, then we have this huge deviation from this group orientation in an individualistic direction. And therefore, we have more and more women who are not evolved to be patriarchal, who are not evolved to be religious, who are not evolved to be feminine in the traditional sense. Um, and those women are much more likely to, identi um, to identify uh, with being feminists. And feminist identification is associated with being physically unattractive, as I said, with being masculinized, with um, being aggressive, with all, all of this, with being unsubmissive to patriarchal values, with mental illness, with physical illness and whatever. They are an expression of this mutation. You used to have it right at the bottom of society because we were in a situation where under harsh selection pressures, um, every generation, the people at the bottom died out. And uh, because of the harsh selection pressures, and we got more and more healthy and adapted every generation. Now, it's, we, we've had this huge rise in individualism. And what that has meant um, um, is that the whole society has flipped over from being group oriented to being individually oriented. Um, uh, and to practicing individualistic values. It used to be that you would signal that you were group oriented, that you were brave, that you were pro that you were good for the group. Now you signal your belief in equality and whatever. So the whole thing flips over, um, and then fe feminism becomes the new ideology for women, and it's spearheaded by the most maladaptive women, which is why the greater your left wing feminist identification is, the more mentally ill you tend to be. Um, because um, it is these are these are a maladaptive way of seeing the world. We are evolved to be mentally stable. If you're mentally unstable, this will go together with other uh, mutational load, maladaptive things um, such as feminism. Um, and so, therefore, we are increasingly being taken over by literal witches. That's the argument. <laughs> um, I mean, I I'm I could I'm partial to the argument. I think it's a uh, it's it's can be compelling. I'm I'm curious how you see this. I mean, um, is this a question of a, a critical mass of these essentially these defector, you know, these these kind of spiteful mutants gaining power and then translating that into kind of m mimetics as well? Because this is essentially a mind virus as well as you know representing some form of genetic substrate. I'm sure that is, but is it possible that that's essentially the thing that got the ball rolling? And now, you know, we have this culture that's emerged from these groups that are kind of intransigent minorities, and they're very, very, you know, vocal about the the rights and, and the direction they want society to go in. Um, and it's, I mean, as as in a way, a former feminist, I have a, I have a degree in gender studies, so I, I, I kind of know the field from the inside. Um, I, I can I can understand the appeal of this type of uh, you know the ideology. It's it's not necessarily just. Um, yes, I think I think you're right about that. So I think that you start. I think that you, as I I was trying to summarize it as quickly as possible because I was yeah, of I was going off. But I think that what it starts off with is um, once the Darwinian conditions break down, then we are evolved to be with genetically normal people. And if we are with genetically subnormal people, then it messes up our, us up as well, because we are suddenly in an evolutionary mismatch to which we are not evolved. So an example of this is depression. Depression is highly genetic, but depression can also is also contagious. It can spread. If you're with someone that has depression, let's say for mainly genetic reasons, you can catch it, as it were, and, and, and it can spread. So I think that's what happened. I think with the breakdown of Darwinian selection pressure, you got more and more of what we would call these spiteful mutants of these people with these maladaptive ideas of women who wanted to be like men, for example, who would have been selected out because under normal conditions, everything 
submission to patriarchy, uh, religiousness, mental health, physical health, intelligence, it all have gone together in a, in a sort of bundle. Um, with the weakening of selection pressures, this bundle starts to come apart, um, and therefore you get more and more of these what you call spike movements. They, they increase in number for genetic reasons, but they also increase in number, as you say, for mimetic reasons. They influence those that are around them. And so they start to push society in a direction that, at the environmental level, which moves it away from this, uh, this group-oriented uh, high level of group orientation that we had we had previously had, and so people gradually become more and more and more individualistic for both genetic reasons and for um, environmental reasons. And eventually, a, a tipping point is kind of reached. And it's been suggested by research on this that that tipping point might be as little as twenty percent. And whether it's twenty percent in the whole society or merely twenty or twenty percent among the elite. But anyway, 20%. And once that happens, then people become aware that, that, that uh, things are moving in a new direction and they start affecting en masse over to the new up and coming and supposedly powerful uh, way of doing things. And so therefore, we see a movement very quickly from group orientation to individualism. And I think that that happened around, in England anyway, around 1963. And that's often highlighted in England and America. Um, sex came rather late for me in 1963, somewhere between the end of the Chatterley Band, the Beatles' first LP, where we move from the from the conservative, religious, Christian, aristocratic sort of society um, to this society uh, based around uh, individualism. And then you start to get runaway individualism. Once it happens, then people who are more intelligent, people like you, will be better at absorbing the dominant ideology, better at realising the benefits of holding to the dominant ideology, better at rationalising the dominant ideology, and better at sort of forcing themselves through effortful control to believe the dominant ideology. And then once that happens, then you start to get runaway individualism because the way that you get ahead in that system is to absorb the dominant ideology and signal your adherence to it by pushing it in a more extreme direction slightly not so extreme that you seem like you're bonkers that's the kind of thing the spiteful mutants will do people like andrea dworkin or whatever like that they'll be the people that will be coming up with things saying all sex is rape or or or, or, or whatever but um but in a, in a slightly more extreme direction so there's these two dimensions to it there are these spiteful mutants who will also be perhaps intelligent and who will get into positions of power you know through being charismatic or whatever and influence people uh, and then there's this um and this creates this system and then a, th a third dimension to it is just dysphoria so it, it, we have an increasing evolutionary mismatch. We are evolved towards five moral, well, it can be more than that, but let's say five moral foundations. Uh, sanct the group-oriented foundations of sanctity, uh, uh, obedience to authority, and group loyalty, and these tend to map onto being conservative, um, and also then the individualizing foundations of equality and harm avoidance, and these tend to map onto being liberal and we, we have a balance between these and if you push a society too far in one set of values as you saw perhaps in communism with the stress on equality then this creates dysphoria and people feel unhappy and and depressed and whatever if you push it the other way too far too group oriented same thing you have people people are sort of regimented and can't think like north korea you, know, you can't think for themselves or whatever um and so you have to get this balance between the two and what we do is it seems that things always move leftwards um because uh, conservatives have all five of these moral foundations whereas liberals uh, only have two of them which is the individualizing ones and so therefore we conservatives give ground to liberals so it's perfectly possible for this reason for a, a, a woman who is not a mutant as we say who is not even who is perfectly genetically healthy um, to be uh, sucked into this once it starts to become the dominant way of doing things in society, because um, these women are going to be adapted to uh, to have certain things like it's adaptive to obey authority, it's adaptive to be brainwashable under normal conditions, it's adaptive, um, you know, to signal your your morality under normal conditions, and it's adaptive to adopt the dominant religion of the society under normal conditions. But under normal conditions, those things are adaptive things. And we're not under those conditions anymore. So suddenly those things are maladaptive. And the other thing about females in particular 
Uh, well, females are also are more are more conformist than men. They're more cooperative. So if there is a dominant way of doing things, they tend to be more inclined to to to, to go along with it. Um, women are higher in mental instability than men, and so um, this can mean that they desire, they fear social ostracism. And uh, mental instability can be associated with extrinsic religiousness, i.e. with signalling your religiousness, going to church, for example, in a religious society, because you want to be seen to be religious. And so it would follow that in a, in a woke society, you would want to be seen to be BLM. You would want to be there, you know, and that's why there's so many girls involved. And the final suggestion is that if women are evolved to a patriarchal society in which they are directed to do things by their parents... Uh, by their fathers, by their mothers, by their brothers, and that's taken away, then it will be more of an evolutionary mismatch for them. So um, it's perfectly possible, therefore, for quite genetically healthy women to become involved in feminism. But I'm just saying that it's those at the extremes. They tend to have more masculinized hands, more masculinized faces, and they tend to be these are strategists, as we say. They, 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 they are evolved for, as, as a sort of a violent, untrusting world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that that maps onto my experience as well. And there's just an interesting dynamic with status coming from Eastern Europe, and I guess any any sort of second or third world country. It's, you know, I, I studied in the West. So whatever mimetic, you know, dominant ideology was was trendy in the West, for me to uh, accede to that was already kind of a, a jump from, you know, whatever ideology was 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 present in, in my environment. So uh, I, you know, I went, I studied in, in Austria and I was like, okay, this is, this is, this is the, the correct version of history because this is what the Western people study. This is what they are teaching us here at the, at the Western place. <laughs> so I, I, yes, it's, a, it's a very notice. It's a very, um, common fallacy and it's a very, and it's a common fallacy because it's a common psychological inclination to believe something and to, and to accept something because it's associated with socioeconomic status. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter that it's logical or reasonable. The point is that it's associated with socioeconomic status. And uh, there came a point, it wasn't the case in the 20s or 30s, but it, it was the case in the 20s or 30s that being religious and conservative was associated with socioeconomic status. And you had these up and coming leftist oddballs on the borders of society, you know, like E.M. Foster, e. M. Foster and, and, and people like that, who were promoting individualism. But now it's the other way round. And so it's being uh, an extreme individualist, it's being woke, it's believing that men are women and women are men and postmodernism and all this that's associated with status and so it's it's very 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 tempting for people if they are um conformist or if they are a little bit insecure uh, which i think is one of the reasons why leftism is associated with uh, uh, mental instability I, i'm not sure I, i've read some people have argued that it's just always like that it's kind of inherent to leftism and to agree that may be true but i can't help but thinking that no in nazi germany it would have been the same kind of people that are preaching wokeism now that would have been smashing up jewish shops then and it's the same mentality if you're insecure you project and you you need to be seen to believe it and you fear social ostracism so you go over the top you know um so i think it's that um that would do it and i i've been in eastern europe i was a guest a, a, um, a visiting researcher at riga stradina university in the anthropology department um, about 10 years ago and it was very noticeable even then that the people that very few people spoke english but those that did either were under 30 and looked rich or under 30 and looked like hippies. And needless to say, the ones that were under 30 and looked like hippies were left wing and were just imitating Western mores. And I'm sure it's got it's it's got more pronounced now. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, in a way, it kind of m makes these countries a little bit stuck in this in this uh, in these paradigms, uh, because, you know, now the the up and coming smart people in, in Romania are, are almost completely welded to whatever comes, you know, piping hot out of the European Union's, uh, uh, you know, propaganda arm uh because that is you know this is the uh the aspirational culture that we've barely made it you know we barely got in i don't even know what you should have got in but um you know it's uh it's it's quite striking that there's no really um except for maybe like you know traditional orthodox 
you know, right wing <laughs> semi paramilitary people that are like a handful of them. There's not really any opposition to this Western individualism that you're describing uh, as the the you know the dogmatic culture that we need to 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 enter into, and that's that's the future of the country. Um, I mean, I see a lot of problems with this, but it's just because I've kind of I've been through the ringer through all of this ideology, and I've kind of come out on the other side, and I can see it for both sides. But um, it's you know the, the the status effect is quite high here. Yeah, well, this seems to be a common thing with females who are who are. Uh, um of your viewpoint that they have they have as you say been through the ringer they have they have started off as being um feminists there's a number of them that i know uh, and then they become quite the opposite so what what made you become quite the opposite then what was it was it your what, what were your experiences in austria that made you suddenly doubt all this Oh, it wasn't necessarily in Austria. I mean, that's where I studied. And then I, I lived in Spain for a while. And then I, I lived in London. I worked in technology for a while. Um, essentially, it was just playing out the, the, the game theory of, uh, of, of what I saw. And, you know, uh, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, what can't go on, won't go on situation you know just just maybe thinking five steps ahead and seeing where this all leads um obviously this on, on many on many planes but um yeah and i don't know <laughs> it was it was pretty obvious to me after i finished university that you know feminism in in the flavor that i was taught wasn't it wasn't just not viable it was you know full of full of logical inconsistencies holes you know, miss, missing data, you know, fake social science, whatever, whatever you want, you know, the second you, you step, you take one step back from it, uh, you can, you can kind of see it for what it is. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it, it became pretty obvious that it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's not a, yeah, it's not a very good ideology. No, no. It's um, it's an ide- it's an ideology of uh, that, that creates it's 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 both I suppose it's a reflect I think it's partly a reflection of this deviation from genetic norms that it, we're evolved to in the West uh, of of patriarchy and, uh, and and so on and so one would expect to be associated with a sort of mental instability at least at the extreme um, and it is um, uh, I mean it's associated with rape fantasies and that's interesting because rape fantasies are themselves associated with sociosexuality. So what you basically have at the, at the extreme unstable ecology is everybody's out for themselves. Life is a dangerous, unstable, violent situation. And to the extent that you want a male at all, you want a male who is physically tough. Because if you have sex with him, then your children will be physically tough and they'll be more likely to survive and your genes will be passed on. So women that are evolved to a society to a, or brought up in a highly unstable environment as well, with lots of men passing through, or whatever, they tend to adopt this kind of strategy and go for these kinds of men. And therefore, the rape fantasy exists because they what they need basically is to be dominated by an alpha male, a dominant alpha male in the jungle sense of alpha. And the proof that he's dominant is that they fight him off and nevertheless he gets through their defences. That's the proof of his dominance. That's in effect kind of rape, that he, that he fights and they fight back and he overcomes them and thus he's he's dominant but it's no good being raped by a beta male and those are the normal men in um, advanced societies that do that they can't get men any other women any other way so they gang together and they find some woman and they and they uh, attack her that's no good because that's no good for your genes it's got to be an alpha male so that's why there's this tension and it's rather like the tension in the way that insemination works itself that the man throws half a billion spermatosa at the woman's immune system and the woman fights them to the death, you know, kills them, destroys them. And finally, one gets through the best, healthiest, the, the most, our strategy, the most ad- ad- adapted to an unstable, violent ecology sperm. That's the one that gets through. And it's, I think, very noteworthy with regard to my book on witches that witches would have these fantasies. The, what was, what, I, they'd have them in England where there was no torture of witches in England. Um, and they would freely admit to these fantasies where the devil came to me as a black man and had sex with me on six consecutive nights. You know, these kinds of things. Um, and so I, it, I think to me it's very obvious these were just rape fantasies. That's what these were. But these women, um, these fast life history strategy women, they couldn't understand what they were. And so they could, uh, you could see why, they'd see why they might think. And they were very intense. Andrea Dworkin had a fantasy like this, a rape fantasy, the, the feminist writer that was so intense she believed it. She really believed it. 
but it's obviously not true. Couldn't have been true. It wasn't consistent with any of the known events that this could possibly have happened to her. So um, I do think that these these things do sort of um, cross over, and it's it's very very dangerous when this feminism it creates then this dysphoria where it, people are brainwashed with this idea that you're a loser and you're pathetic if you want to be a mother or you want to have children or you want to spend time on your career. And the result of that is that you're pressured not to and you're pressured to delay and you're pressured to delay having kids and delay finding a husband and to, to ignore um, your basic adaptive ways of behaving. Like we had a case in Britain recently of this woman called Sarah Everard she um it sort of touched me in a way because she was a few years younger than me she went to durham university which is where i went um and she was living in london and she was 33 years old she was single and she was childless and she was walking alone at night in the dark through a park in central london and she was murdered and there was this big scandal about this and i thought to myself well yeah it's very awful it's terrible that it's happened to her of course it's absolutely terrible that it's happened to her but that woman, in a sense, is a victim of feminism because she had been inculcated with this idea that you should delay, you know, concentrate on your career or delay fertility until it's potentially too late. There she was, 33, single. Um, and there she was walking alone at night. Which I wouldn't walk alone at night in London in the dark in a park. I would. Yes. <laughs> And, and but there she was walking alone at night in London in, a, in the dark in a park, having absorbed this maladaptive ideology that says that men are the same as women and that there are no differences and it's a gender is a social construct. And that's the impression one gets from what we know about her. Um, and she was she was a she was a, she was a victim to this ideology. And that, OK, that's a, a victim in a very dramatic and tragic way. But in a more subtle way, the victimhood is women that find that they're in their 30s and they could have had kids. They could have had kids, but they left it too late. Another um, evolutionary mismatch is that women are of course evolved to sexually select for status the man has nothing to lose from the sexual encounter he, it's in his interest to have sex with as many women as he possibly can and to the extent that he's selective he'll want women that have evidence youth and fitness so he goes for youth and beauty the, the woman goes for these things as well uh, well at least for beauty but like evidence of good genes but uh, also for status because if the man's of higher status he'll be able to invest in her and her offspring will be more likely to survive and so, therefore, women will tend to marry up, tend to marry hypergamously, tend to be sexually attracted for status. You get this even between countries. I did a study which looked at the, all of the multicultural marriages which took place in Finland in 2013. And I found that the Finnish uh, women married men, foreign men, from countries that were richer than Finland, like England and America and Germany, and Finnish men married women from countries that were poorer than Finland, like Eastern Europe and whatever. And that makes exactly what you would expect. And, um, and now the problem is that women, because they're more conscientious than men, because they're more agreeable than men, because the, um, uh, their average IQ is a little bit lower, but that's only because of men having higher people at the extremes. So basically the average IQ for all intents and purposes is the same. Therefore, they do better in education than men. Um, and therefore, they become more educated than men. And therefore, they want to marry up but they can't because all the men have gone. And so there's no one to marry up to. And they're repelled by the idea of marrying down. And so either they're unsatisfied and marry a bit of rough or they don't marry and they, and they sort of become lesbians, um, w uh, which seems to occur with a lot of these women in their 30s and 40s that are single. They, 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 they start to become gay because of the, the, the plasticity of female sexuality is very high for various evolutionary reasons. And so it's just messing them all up. And so it, it would be much better if it, it was accepted. We know that from the way men and women behave, they want different things. Yes, they quite like status. They do like that. But they also want to have babies. And, in, and, and when they're allowed to have, um, that's the interesting thing. When a society renders them absolutely free, like in the West, perhaps not in the Eastern Europe yet, but in the wet in Western Europe, then you find that the sex differences in what subject you study at university become bigger, become mm -hmm. massive. The sciences become dominated by men, and the, the arts and history and things like that, and childcare type jobs, teaching and stuff become dominated by women. That is not the case, um, as I understand it, uh, to the same extent in places that are more patriarchal, like Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, because women don't have complete freedom yet. Once they have that, then they will you get 
the fewer women. And then they start moaning about, oh, why aren't there enough women involved in science? Oh, my God, it's terrible. But it's women <laughs> that are choosing not to do that. And they choose not to do that because their interests are, 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 are different. They're, they're, they are more empathetic. They are less analytical. Um, Simon Baron Cohen talks about the extreme male brain and the extreme female brain. The extreme male brain is autistic. That, and, uh, you know, it is, it is really good at systematizing, but it is... It is empathy blind. It is. It is. Whereas the female, the extreme female brain is is quite the opposite of that. Um, so so yeah, it just messes them up, and it's it's a very terrible thing, feminism. And um, hopefully, it will pass. Yeah. So I think um, you know the the idea that that women will tend to gravitate towards more feminine typical activities maps pretty well onto how things have evolved here in Romania in the last you know ten to twenty years. Back in communism, we used to have uh, you know kind of it was our pride and joy to explain to people that uh, you know we have the most uh, female engineers and we had I don't know drilling oil engineers and all sorts of things, which was part of the the communist ethos that you know you have equality across the board and and women had to do these things because you know to for for survival purposes it was the best thing to do you know you were we were much better paid if you're an engineer or a doctor um but but now you know you can see you know most most women are either nurses teachers or they work part-time if they can afford it if they can't if they, if they go into medicine they go into specific areas of medicine so they're more likely to go into psych doctors i mean they go into psychiatry or they go into into pediatrics yeah. They don't go into, you know, like being a surgeon. Yeah, orthopedic surgeons, not that many, not that many women. Yeah, um, you you also mentioned the the fast life history strategy uh, in females, but um, I think I've heard you talk about this in males as well as tied into the the phenomenon of incels. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting point because incels tend to you know see see themselves as this uh, kind of ostracized group of people who are excluded from you know the whole spectrum of mating opportunities. But I, I thought your point was interesting that you know they do tend to to focus on on kind of the the, the fast life history strategy rather than yeah i get the they, i do get the impression that um, that they are failed fast life history strategists and so if you if you look at a a, a good example of this if, if we take let's say the bushman of the kalahari the bushman of the kalahari are fast life history strategists they are they are mini despotisms uh, in which the head man will dominate the gene pool every generation. The head man will have like six, seven wives and various concubines because the women are, of course, sexually attracted to the um, do dominant male. And in the absence of uh, monogamy, uh, then the dominant male will have loads and loads and loads of wives. Um, and then the beta males, the sort of subalterns, they'll have a few wives. But you end up with a situation where it's been calculated from ethnographies that about 60% of these men don't have children don't pass on their genes. Now, these are our strategists. I mean, that's what these people are, these people that are living in the Kalahari. They live fast, die young, unstable ecology, food everywhere, you know, easy yet unstable ecology kind of people. Um, but they are, ultimately, they are failed, our strategists. And uh, all they can hope is to find a few, uh, a few stray women and sort of gang rape them. Um, and that's that's how they will that's how they will pass on their genes and let sperm selection do the rest. And it's interesting to note that when men uh, there was a very interesting book on this called The Natural History of Rape that men when men um, uh, rape uh, uh, they produce more semen than when they have normal sex. And when men uh, masturbate over pornography that involves violence they produce more semen. And of course men are sexually aroused by violence. Um, and also, uh, so are women, perhaps to some extent. But that, that, that reason for that relationship is because of the fact that in our prehistory, those that raped would be more. Would be, that was one method that, by which you passed on your genes. Um, now, with this R and K strategy, R strategy, unstable environment, easy environment, live fast, die young, invest lots of your energy in sex. Um, no point investing any energy in your offspring because they could be wiped out at any minute, and therefore no no point investing any energy in, in their mother either. So you just have sex with as many people as possible and hope that some of your genes are passed on. As the environment becomes more stable and harsher, um, you have to adapt to that ecology and you have to look after your children and, and whatever. Otherwise, they might all just die.
You can't just have loads of children and invest nothing in them. They might all just die. You get close to the carrying capacity for the ecology. You're competing with each other. It's competitive. It's harsh. And so therefore you move energy away from investment in sex and towards investment in nurture. And so this creates quite different psychology of people. People become more agreeable, more cooperative, more kind, more mentally stable. They have higher impulse control. They generally have a desire to nurture and look after each other. They reduce the numbers of children they have. They reduce the numbers of offspring they have. Of, uh, wives they have, um, their life slows down, uh, they become less interested in physical characteristics and more interested in mental characteristics, you know, they trade one for the other, so you might trade, a, I don't know, a woman that has really big breasts for a woman that doesn't have very big breasts, but evidence is that she's submissive to the patriarchy and has a kind, loving, nurturing sort of personality. You know, these kinds of trade-offs occur. They tend to select more for genetic similarity because if you're more genetically similar to someone, you'll bond with them more and therefore you'll invest more in the offspring and they'll be more adapted to this tough environment. And so you, um, you get these changes. Now, these incels, all they go on about is sex. They don't say, oh, I really, really want to have a relationship. Uh, I, I really, really want to find the right woman for me and wouldn't it be great? I'd like to do that and have children with them and, and whatever. And, from, and it, from, in, in an ecology that's relatively K strategy, which R still is, and in an ecology where women are, although it's decreasingly the case because of the breakdown of patriarchy and the breakdown of sexual rules, but to a certain extent, women are still on the lookout for high status males, one, and two, males that evidence the desire and the ability to nurture. And it's interesting that when they've looked at the kind of faces that women find the most sexually attractive, it's not the most masculine face. It's like the second or third most masculine face. And there's a reason for that. It's because the second or third most masculine face also has some feminine qualities. And women like those minor degree of feminine qualities in men because they want a man that's not going to beat them up and not going to beat their kids up. It's that's going to nurture. And so that's what they're selecting for. It's a big part. Women are selecting for men who are nurturers. And so if you go in there with the attitude, oh, I'll not have sex with her. Oh, yeah, she's not. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, that's no good. That's repellent to women. What women are looking for, at least the kind of women that um, you, you know, that are slappers, um, is, um, um, are feminists, is a, a man who is a, a relative nurturer. But they're not, they don't seem to be interested in that. They just seem to be, often they're unattractive men you do get women that will be interested in physically unattractive men if those men, they will trade physical attractiveness for mental qualities. If they are physically unattractive, but they have these mental qualities of intelligence, of the ability to gain status, of, um, of nurturing a, a, a propensity, then it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter that they're not alpha males with big muscles and whatever. But what you have with these uh, these uh, incels is the worst of both worlds. You have people that seem to be physically unattractive and mentally unattractive. So they're just our strategists, mm -hmm. failed our strategists. Um, so I don't see why they could hope to get women at all. Yeah, I think there's 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 also the, the the fact that some men, you know, just like you were describing, even historically, weren't able to access the uh, the, the the breeding population, and I but think that's probably now. That's that's one thing that's germane though about the collapse about feminism. It's created a situation, or, or about um, uh, the uh, loosening of sexual restrictions, is that there's now more of them. So yeah. it used to be that you had monogamy. One, sex was very strongly regulated. Two, affairs and things were totally unacceptable and even punishable by law. And so basically most of, of, these, of these men would be able to get women. Um, they might not be particularly pleasant unions, but they would be able to access women. With the collapse of that, of that system, with the rise of, of, uh, of sexual libertinism and the rise of feminism, we have reverted back to the system of the Bushmen, where um, the, 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 the women um, are no longer restricted by patriarchy. They can do whatever they like. They, of course, gravitate towards the higher status males. Um, those higher status males get lots of sex and they choose the best women of the crop. The other women choose some people or just don't marry at all in the end. And you get lots and lots of these single men. And that destabilizes society because then you get lots of conflict between the men and, uh, and jealousy. And, uh, yeah, and, and, like and 
this seems to be accelerated by kind of this algorithmic dating, you know, the, the fact that you can essentially choose someone on your phone in a matter of minutes, swipe through very superficial characteristics that either tie to, you know, physical appearance or status markers or whatever the person wants to present about themselves. Um, and I think that's one of the arguments that incels have that, you know, this further restricts the dating pool because essentially what it does is it creates a an access route, a direct access route between a very limited number of high status males and essentially the whole female population because these men will sleep with these women at least once and they will have theoretical access to the high status males. So it's essentially just kind of corralling them into a harem. But, it, but what it's, what, that's right, that's, that's true. But you've got to think about, those, those incels should think about what are the kind of women that would do this? And the kind of women that would do this would be our strategy women. They're the kind of women that were you to marry them, they'd probably have affairs and break your heart anyway. It has become quite um, standard. I mean, I've, I've met my husband on, on a dating app. So, I mean, obviously you can use these apps in, in different ways, and but they have become pretty much the uh, the standard way of meeting someone, especially in an urban environment. I think it's become... But it's it's appalling because it's it's a total evolutionary mismatch. You're meant to. We are evolved to have arranged marriages. If anything, we are yes. evolved for our friends, our parents, and to a lesser extent, our friends to set us up with people. And yeah, now they're That's arranged by it. algorithms. <laughs> now they're arranged by computer. So, I mean, that's a, an evolutionary mismatch. That uh, that shouldn't be like that. I don't understand, though. I mean, I'm obviously a bit older than you. I don't. Uh, how old are you? I'm 32. Okay, you're about 10 years, eight years younger than me. God, only eight years, and it's that different. Yeah, absolutely. It's become the standard. You could even see it. Um, it was when I first moved to London, that was about six years ago. People would still, you know, talk to you when you were out and, you know, people would still date physically. They would, you know, engage in banter and try to charm you and, you know, offer you a drink or something like that. Then maybe four, five years ago, the standard changed. You know, you were out and people were on their phones swiping through people because it's a, it's a low impact activity. You know, you reduce the chance of being rejected. You, uh, you increase your exposure to different types of people that have been pre-sorted by the algorithm for you. Um, so there's, you know, the, the, the reduction in friction, I think was crucial in, in, you know, it, it, yeah, in, in ushering is in, in this new this new dawn of technology. And I think a lot of the incels are kind of fighting or, or, or saying that okay, this really does freeze out a lot of men from from the from the pool of people who, who get to have a date just because the, the top guys there's not really a cap on how much they want to date. You know, they'll they'll date. It's no problem. So, you know, as as they, men, they won't, but if if a woman is looking for having a relationship and having children, then these probably aren't the guys for them, are they? These sound like cads, founders. Yeah, I think a lot of women are starting to realize that, but the 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 mechanism of the app doesn't really make that very clear because you are, you know, the 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 premise of this app is that you are dating. Dating means different things to different people, obviously. So you are going out on a date, you're having a drink with someone, and you think, okay, this is my this is my league. If you're a woman, you're like, okay, this is my league. I'm dating this investment banker today. He's a nice, good-looking, charming guy, and he never calls back. And then the second investment banker, he never calls back, or you know, whoever you're attracted to, they seem very flaky. And not necessarily because they're bad people, but they're not interested in having one liaison with you when they could have, I don't know, 20 with 20 different women. They're, not, they're all strategists and they want to sow their wild oats with as many different kinds of women as possible. And even if they don't find them that attractive, at least there's... there's, there's, there's yeah, there's but I, I feel like there's there's also kind of an incentive to be an art strategist. I mean, if, if you're, if you're you know, a, a, a guy, you, you might, if you're on the, on the edge between R and K, maybe you're considering what type of strategy you might want to adapt. You know, having, having women fling themselves at you and and you know through low friction interactions on your phone might convince you that our being an r strategist for for a good 10 years might be a better way of uh, of spending your your youth so so that's fascinating so it's it's so it's literally creating an r strategy ecology uh, and what that means of course as well is that people that are, that are our strategists you know they don't want necessarily to have children they don't want to have children. some of them do like some of them if they are if they're like uh um, narcissistic or something and they, they see children as an extension of self and evidence of their health and brilliance they might want to have children but as a rule they don't want to have children because they don't want to invest in children a modern society makes you invest in children so you don't want to have children 
So it, it, uh, it, they tend not to have children, or if they do, they have them because they're impulsive and they have them by accident. But they, they don't actually want to because, because the condom doesn't work or something, or they don't bother to use a condom because they're too impulsive. But they, do, but it, in general, they don't want to have children, and so it, it, it will do things to the future. It will, it will mean that these kinds of people will probably not pass on their genes. It will change the future. It will mean that the people that are resistant to this new crucible of evolution, which is wokeness plus technology plus sexual libertinism, the people that are genetically resistant to this, who are genetically conservative and patriarchal and high in religiousness, they will have children. And also people that are just stupid and, and have them by accident, they will have children. And nobody else will have children. And they'll just spend their and they'll just spend their twenties and thirties sodding around, having lots of promiscuous relationships, or being bitter that they're not having any promiscuous relationships, and they'll keep trying and keep trying. Yeah. And, and there's some um, there's um a, another dynamic here as well, because in a way, what these apps do is is present a very restricted uh, number of men to all women. So essentially, the, these this small subset of men. Is, you know, dictates what the sexual mores will be in this kind of larger group of, of, you know, men and women. So I think it does pull things to a more promiscuous end because the women are all competing for these men. They see them as flaky. They see them, you know, they need to up the ante. They need to be more desirable, more sexy. They need to put out, they, you know, because if, if I'm not going to, you know, not going to do it, maybe, you know, the next girl will and she'll steal him. And there's all this intersexual competition. It pressures them to degrade themselves to do anal god knows <laughs> yeah it could be yeah, yeah um yeah i see this is a really appalling and d d depraved situation and uh, I, no no one has put it to me with as much clarity as you have um oh good heaven oh god help us but what but what, but what that also what that does mean as i say though is that you've got the it, it, it could be good for the group in the long run because it was probably going to mean that these kinds of our strategy um, and they're probably irreligious and uh, whatever the individualistic people um, will sort of die out, and um, and that's uh, that's a good thing for the for removing this leftist individualistic society that we currently have, and, and getting a more a, be a better balance, which will then permit more freedom of of thought and whatever. So I can see advantages to this, but there are obviously. Um, tremendous disadvantages for those that are sucked into it and, and brainwashed into uh, and whatever it is. Another thing, I suppose, is that we have at the moment a, a dis an unstable society. There's a guy called Peter Turkin, who is a Russian demographer, and he's argued that one of the things that's making society unstable at the moment is the overpromotion of elites. So we have too many people that have degrees. When my parents, my parents were born in the fifties, and when they went to university in the seventies, the early seventies, about eight percent of the British population went to university of their age group, and that includes things like teacher training colleges and nursing. Eight um, percent, and now it's like half. And so this leads to an overpromotion of elites. It leads to all the there's a the limited number of elite places. So you have all these bitter people who who want to get into the elite. Uh, who think they should be in the elite, these entitled people with their degrees. And so therefore you end up with this vicious fight among the elites to get elite places. And therefore you have this cancel culture, wokeness and whatever, where you try to destroy other people who are uh, contenders for elite places. And it destabilizes the society and leads to polarization. And um, so you have the, it, society lies to you and tells you, yeah, look, here's this degree which you have to pay for and you'll, you'll, you'll have access, you'll be part of the elite. No, you, you won't be. And similarly, I suppose this app is kind of allowing women to lie to themselves it's allowing women to think i'm in this league i'm 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 a, i'm a beautiful woman this investment banker wants me i'm a, i'm a top i'm an alpha woman but you're not because the men aren't choosy the women are choosy the women marry up remember the women hypergamously they want the best standard of men and so um and in the old days they'd be limited to the men in their village or in their town or whatever and now they're limited to the men in, you know, London mm -hmm. or England or the world, and um, and they and they just want the top ones, and so it fools them into thinking that they they are capable of actually bagging one of these men as the as the top wife, as it were, as as the as the head of the harem, um, and they're not. 
and so it just sort of uh, they're, they're nowhere close to it. And but they don't but they don't even consider going for a man who is more within their league. Perhaps it would be better to have an app where they paired people up based on the physical qualities of their faces. Um, and they rendered the man a little bit uglier than the woman, because that's how it works. Men marry up in terms of beauty. The, the, the woman is objectively more attractive a, a bit than her husband. Um, and you see this quite often with a rich man who's ugly as hell, but, and he's, he's got a pretty wife. That's, mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's a known dynamic. Um, so maybe that, would, that should be how they should consider doing it. That would be a more reasonable way of doing it rather than allowing all these women to fall themselves into going for yeah. the top 20% of men or whatever it is. I think for um, some people who, who kind of have the, 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 the rational capabilities of, of wrapping their mind around all the, the pitfalls of these apps, you know, technology is starting to, to trail and it's starting to produce things like there they're, they're people trying to do arranged marriages now for Western and couples, uh, which is a bit more than matchmaking because you kind of have to um you kind of have to make a financial commitment a sizable financial commitment that you're not going to divorce uh you know when you enter in this uh, in this covenant of the arranged marriage um there are um a, kind of a, a lot of people defecting from the standard there's a lot of people going back to religion there are people, a lot of people going back to church looking for you know their their ideal uh, mormon wife or mormon husband that is where that is where you will meet the right kinds of blood and the right kinds of chaps that's where you'll meet k strategists that's where you'll meet people that are in it for commitment and nurture in somewhere like church that's that's uh, uh that is the case so yeah i can see why they would they would do that oh this is just awful absolutely awful but yeah but yeah, you've done a well out of it. You, you 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 how long have you been with your husband that you met through this uh, degenerate system <laughs> it, it was the the only system at my disposal unfortunately <laughs> there were no churches in, in central london or at least there were there were museums uh, close to where i live um so we i mean i think we, we've been married a year now and i've met him maybe four years ago um so yeah I, I didn't spend that much time on the apps. I was kind of pretty pretty adamant about the type of person I was looking for. And I was very specific about what I wanted. So I think that was quite a good strategy for me. And I think a lot of women should be doing this, you know, to be specific about the fact that, okay, I'm using this as a, a database of people. You know, this is the way we meet now. And I am, you know, I'm this type of person. I'm looking for a long-term commitment from someone who's, you know, kind of has the same dream as I have. And, you know, if, if you're the, that type of of long-term commitment person you know maybe we should talk and maybe we should you know chat about it so you're kind of trying to circumvent the um the the context that you're in i mean it, this is this is the only way i found to do it and it's worked out really well for me obviously you know we'll talk in 20 years but it seems to be a pretty pretty robust arrangement that we have no, 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 I'm, I'm highly pregnant at the moment so i mean it's already bearing oh, are, fruit. You, are you highly pregnant oh, well, that's, that's good. at least your at least your genetics are compatible enough for you to become pregnant Oh yeah, oh, for right. sure. No, no, he's he's uh, he's uh, strangely he's uh, I'm I'm German Polish by heritage, and he's German Polish by heritage as well. But he's from New Zealand, so yeah, we're we're very interestingly compatible, though by a long shot. Yeah, I suppose that that, that kind of thing can happen. That's uh, that's that's true. How pregnant are you? I'm six months pregnant, but I look like I'm nine months pregnant because we're both very uh, tall people. So I don't know. This baby is very big. It's in the 96th percentile by by weight, so I don't know. We might need an airlift or something. Oh gosh, oh, well, the, well, the first, <laughs> the first, what the first birth is the worst. It's very, very painful and unpleasant. I, I don't. Uh, oh well. <laughs> my, my wife had our first child. Oh my goodness me! I, I, was, I couldn't believe that was a success. That that, that was marked as a successful birth. The amount of blood involved. Oh Jesus! Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, but you won't, you won't enjoy it. Enjoy I mean, it. I've I've heard I won't enjoy it, but I think you know. I just hope it I'll survive be, it. It won't be an enjoyable <laughs> experience. It won't be this thing like on Friends where you give birth to the child and, and like you rate on friends then look at it and suddenly you're in love not least because it won't smile for weeks anyway um but 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 um uh, yeah it's, well good good luck good luck with all that but no Thank that's, you. Uh, that's <laughs> but i think i think that's what's happening we're, we're moving back to this we're sort of coming apart really on the i think this is the future as i'm looking out in this research i'm doing at the moment where the people that have bre- the, the individualists have taken over expanded and expanded in number uh, and, and now it's got to a point where they've adopted a new sort of a new sort of crucible of ch- like child mortality that's the thing we used to have to survive 
Um, and now what we have to survive is a maladaptive culture of, led by spiteful mutants and individualists, which tells us to do basically maladaptive things, which has caused runaway individualism to the extent that we uh, take on maladaptive ideas, that we should put other families ahead of our own, other peoples ahead of our own, other races ahead of our own, other species ahead of our own. Uh, we should feel guilty for being us. Uh, we, we, we should surround ourselves with things that disgust us all the time naturally just disgust us um that we should have like ugly people in advertising these days that we should do this that, that um, we, we don't even try to be to, to do things well anymore uh we we uh, promote people not because they're best for the job but because they tick certain minority brownie point categories um and, and we create this just this dysphoria which depresses us and it is and makes us do silly things and it is those the people that genetically are resistant to this, either because they're too stupid to absorb it, so they just act on instinct and have lots of kids by accident, or but or because they are basically the remnant normal population from 1800, from the time of your German Polish ancestors. Um, it is those people uh, that uh, will survive, and this is consistent with this. Fertility is associated now with being far right, and um, with being very religious. And any deviation from that is associated with lower fertility. And so I think that what's going to happen will, is that, that you'll just get this coming apart where eventually among intelligent people, you're going to find that it's being right wing that's associated with being uh, with, bre with breeding uh, among intelligent people. And once that happens, then the elite can start to flip over. Uh, but I think that, that it's too late. I think that we're going to come apart. It's what happens in the winter of civilization. You know, there was a time when the Romanians didn't exist and there will be a time when the Romanians don't exist. And this is what happens when civilizations fall, whether it's the Bronze Age collapse or whether it's the, Ro the classical collapse, then you end up with new peoples, new peoples come out of it. And I think that might be, might be what will happen. There'll be parts of most of the West will just be low IQ chaos and there'll be Byzantiums to which intelligent people will flee uh, where, where civilization will sort of carry on. Um, probably Eastern Europe, really, because Eastern Europe is le the least touched by these problems, partly, I guess, because of the sector of communism. Uh, and also, you do seem to be just more genetically ethnocentric than us, you Eastern Europeans. I mean, for example, I, I was reading recently that the average um, Eastern European has half the number of the if you take two random eastern europeans and two random western people the two random eastern europeans have half the number um sorry have double the number of common ancestors as do the two westerners double the number so two random polish people have double the number of common ancestors compared to two random irish people so you have a smaller gene pool you marry people that are close so that's going to make people more ethnocentric so I think that is, is one possible reason why Eastern Europe and Western Europe have gone on different paths. Um, you just have a smaller pop for various historical reasons. I don't know. Islam is probably one reason. Um, um, so I think that's that's where it will be preserved because if you what's happened in the West is we're so you have this sort of I call it a genius culture where you're you're low in ethnocentrism. So that makes you open to outsiders and that means you trade and you learn new things and you expand and you produce more geniuses and you trade and you expand. And as long as your religiousness and therefore your ethnocentrism doesn't get too low, then, well, that's fine. But when it does, due to rising individualism as a consequence of industrializing early um, or due to better living conditions, meaning you're less religious and so and so uh, you lose your ethnocentrism for that reason as well, then you're just really open. You're low in ethnocentrism, you're individualist, and you just don't care. And you're happy to allow yourself to just be invaded. Um, as we see in modern-day Germany, that we don't see in modern-day Slovakia. Um, yeah. and, and so I think uh, that's that we will be selected out, or unlikely that the people like your husband or I'm an example of it as well. I mean, I, I think of myself as a Blairian exile. So I, I, I the, the anti-freedom, uh, pro-extreme individualism of England of Tony Blair was so awful for me that I, I had to get out and go to Finland. And unfortunately, individualism has followed me here sort of <laughs> 20 years late, but it's come here. But, but uh, it's, Finland is ahead of it in reacting strongly against it.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, um, so, yeah. I'm curious how the the countries of Eastern Europe will react to um, to Western individualism because I mean they they have already kind of gotten in line behind a lot of these values um, you know through NGOs multinationals you know all of the, the the culture streaming out of America you know my accent is 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 proof positive that this is you know this is quite virulent here as well and um, it's we we are also a bit of a culture of conformists. You know, and and the lining behind the the high status religion that's that's going on in the West right now is probably something that these cultures would do. Uh, Hungary is less so because they have they have they're quite a, a, a country apart. But uh, I think Romania, Bulgaria, you know, Serbia, they they tend to kind of get in line behind power. So I t- I wish I had more. Yeah, I was talking to a, a guy from Slovenia the other day, and he was telling me that it's a bit of a, a bit of a problem there but for some reason in poland so maybe that maybe that's it maybe you'll be wiped out as well maybe you're just not you're just not high enough in ethnocentric values it'll be poland and hungary that'll be the and slovakia maybe yeah. be the, these countries used to be empires usually you you check which ones used to be historically be empires and then you have some uh kind of mythologically mediated ethnocentrism there romania was usually a battleground bulgaria as well there were no empires here except for you know <laughs> little little you know city states and people trying to to survive the the islamic invasions but it, there, there was no aspirations to be conquerors or to have a civilization that's our own no but why would the polish be more eth- i don't understand i mean like well the, we were eth- conquered by the polish the polish had sobieski they had they had kind of imperial aspirations they have a very kind of cohesive um you know culture of their own um they they weren't i mean they were fighting the you know the the ottomans but they were fighting them from a position of power you know you know they were so often having battles in romania because that was you know it was it was easier to do than let the 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 turks encroach up to up to warsaw um you know i'm just trying to work out what it's to do with it's to being further south what what would be the factor which would mean that um, in, in general Eastern Europeans are more ethnocentric than Western Europeans, but there are differences within Eastern Europe. Fine. Yeah, um, I, th- to work out I think it's also the, the size of the um, the countries. The um, like, for example, Hungary is is quite different to to any other country around it. Their language is completely exotic. They have kind of this very self-contained culture. They also have a very interesting genetic profile as well. They have um, kind of, you know, Mongolian roots, Tatar roots. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're quite a country apart. Poland just has a huge gravitational mass. They're a huge country compared to, and they're also homogenous. They kind of have, you know, his, historical homogeneity in, in that region. Uh, Romania is like three, three small, or city states glued together by necessity. Um, so you're saying Romania is more mixed. It's more ethnically yeah. mixed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, that would help. That would that would explain the that would explain the difference then. Yeah, that would explain. It. Yeah. Okay, I'll write that down. It's worth putting in this book I'm doing at the moment. Um, but but uh, yeah. So so yeah, I think the future will be that's that's, that's at the moment what I think the future is is going to be. But what it will mean is that life goes backwards. I mean, at the moment, if we set the IQ now at a hundred. Uh, the IQ 100 years ago was like 115, and the IQ 100 years or a bit less, 80 years hence, will be 85 in in like Britain, in white countries. So, so what it, would it, the it, the major drivers of that be? The well, the first issue is um, is simply um, it seems to happen always with high civilizations that people just stop breeding, and intelligent people in particular stop breeding. And so therefore IQ goes down. That seems to just always happen. The Romans commented on it, the Greeks commented on it, the Muslims commented on it. It seems to be that you just get this kind of dysphoria you, you, uh, um, and that this um, uh, and intelligent people have better impulse control. So if they don't want to have children, they're better able to avoid having them. You just get this sense of, of you've got everything. You, 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 we humans have evolved to struggle and fight and compete to survive. And once we've got everything, we just become bored. And once we become bored, we become depressed. Um, and there's an extent to which you can allay that by creating things to do, you know, creating goals for yourself like this. But really, our goal should be to get food. And that should be our goal. And if, and if that's guaranteed, then we just become bored. 
and that's guaranteed more for the upper classes in these conditions and whatever. So they stop having children, so IQ goes down. A second reason is the uh, development of contraception. Once you get the development of contraception, then more intelligent people will use it more efficiently. So stupid large families become an accident among the stupid, so IQ goes down. A third reason is it just gets getting warmer. It's been getting warmer since about 1700. So selection pressure is weakened, so IQ goes down. Another reason is the Industrial Revolution. Again, it makes better conditions, whatever effectively selection pressure is weakened, IQ goes down. Another reason is feminism. Feminism means that if you were, think about the girl, when you were at school, like the really stupid girl who's who who, who drops out of school at 16 and has a series of uh, children with a series of men, and she's a grandmother by the time she's 38, and that's when the more intelligent girl has dedicated her 20s and even most of her 30s to her career is becoming a mother. So people that have low IQ have more children and more generations. Um, then you get welfare, which basically uh, permits and even encourages low IQ people to have lots of children. And so all of these things have created a situation where there's now about a minus 0.2 correlation between IQ and how many children you have. And in Britain, if you take families where both parents are working, IQ of about 100, families where one parent is working and one's on welfare, IQ of about 90, that's IQ of, a, I don't know, a, someone that works at a shop or something. Um, and then families where both parents are on welfare, IQ of 80, only those where the I, both parents on welfare have above replacement fertility. And so even independent of immigration, and, independent, and immigration will tend to push IQ down as well because it tends to be from lower IQ countries, um, IQ is going down. And about 85 is the IQ of uh, the average African-American. And that will be the IQ of the average white by the end of the century based on current trends. And what that will mean is the collapse of civilization. Um, or at least it will mean it declines, it goes backwards. Um, and probably the breakup and the escape that, that you'll get areas where civilization is preserved and you're seeing this now this gentrification it's happening apace you get areas in britain where all the clever people go and live and they're nice and then areas in britain where it used to be you'd get lots of different people of different social classes and now they're just working class areas there's no middle class there's no educated people there and they just become like detroit and, yeah uh, and and uh, this is what one would expect. This is happening in America. I mean, people are fleeing California um, and uh, making their way to like Texas and places like this. Uh, and so um, I think this is. Uh, I mean, you would have seen in London that one of the policies they have there is: oh, it's unfair that working class people or people on benefits in London get to have council houses in London because they're worth so much money. So it's so unfair that they get them. So they move them out of London to places that used to be these seaside resorts like Hastings. Um, and so these places just become these just desolate places where nobody works and everyone's ill. And, uh, and so that's the kind of division that seems to be taking place. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it 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 does you know that that's partly why we moved away from London about a year ago. Um, not necessarily because it, it, it was becoming a bit of a of a interesting place to live in terms of crime Where rates. Where were you in London? Where were you in London? Um, I was living in, in East London because I was working in the city. So um, it was Clapton, Clapton, yeah. yeah. That's gentrifying, though. I mean, yeah, is it is. It is. It was really nice. The cafes were delicious and the pastry is great, but also <laughs> you would want to be out at night. So we were kind of in that phase where you, you <laughs> we were transitioning from from a place called the Murder Mile into into something a bit more gentrified. But we're still in very much in the transition phase. So the police was always on the street, like constantly. I was in. I was in Hackney. I was in Dalston mm -hmm. during very the close. Riot in 2011 during the race riots. I had this Nigerian friend and he had this flat in Dalston. I went there during, as they were happening, I was sitting in his flat and there was like missiles going past the window, police helicopters, uh, things being thrown. I was just sitting there during it. It was a very interesting experience. And then I walked with my f a female friend of mine who was very woke and left wing through the riots. No one, no one was interested in us. Through the riots to where she lived in Hackney. And there was this white upper middle class party, and yeah. uh, it was a, yeah that was an interesting. And all of the Turkish, the the because there's no white people with businesses around there anymore. So all of these Turks and whatever that have kebab shops were standing outside with their big knives. Yeah, 
there to protect their businesses. They weren't having any of this, which I thought was very interesting. And my Nigerian friend said to me, Ed, if this kind of thing happened in Nigeria, they would just start shooting and they would not stop <laughs> shooting for a very long time. And it was a sort of advice that we could take from them. Yeah, that that was quite shocking because I, I I used to live before I lived in Captain I used to live in Hagerston, which is essentially Dalston, uh, and there was a riot there that wasn't reported at all by the police. It was kind of a it, there was an incident between a man and the police, and I think the man died in custody or being chased by the police or something like that. I can't remember what was happening, and things were heating up in America as well with BLM and and kind of that narrative, and there was an a literal riot that only appeared on Twitter and never appeared at all on, on any, if you weren't there to see it, you wouldn't have known it had happened, but you know, there was a flaming car, there were fights on the street, there were, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of violent things happening. But I think, you know, th- things happen in these, in these neighborhoods that people just don't report on anymore because it's uh, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not something we talk about. It wouldn't be a good place to bring up this child that you're pregnant with. That would be yeah. Good. That's a, that's a very good observation. I think that was part of uh, part of our, our thinking as well. Uh, it's much, it's much calmer here and, 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 you know, desolate Eastern Europe, but you know, it's, it's, it's nice. Um, there's also the the factor that uh, you've talked about as well about the testosterone levels collapsing. I think this this seems like a, a bit of a environmental thing, or what what could the factor be there? Because it's it be all kind. I mean, there was a there's a book that's just been published arguing it's to do with plastics and things like that, mm-hmm. and that might be relevant. But to be fair, we had lots of plastics and stuff in the 70s, and the collapse since the 70s has been enormous. 59 percent reduction in in semen le- in the uh, semen um, um, uh, uh, semen levels uh, and and so I, I think that could be an element to it but I think it's more likely that just everything is set up to demasculinize men and to make men feel rubbish to, t- to, to create an extreme evolutionary mismatch for, for men and women but with men you've got this toxic masculinity you've got the removal of competition you've got the workplace becoming a woman's place increasingly you've got schools being women's places increasingly um, they take away the ability to compete and be dominant they, all, all of this stuff um, and so um, you, uh, people are becoming fatter as well. That reduces testosterone levels. So I think it's a whole v- variety. Uh, there's probably a part that might be just genetics and mutations and things like that. That makes people more ill because you'll be using more energy to fight off disease. That reduces testosterone levels. The general dysphoria has increased. If people are in a dysphoria, they're basically stressed. That, that produces reduces testosterone levels. Um, so I think there's there's lots and lots of we don't know exactly what, but there's lots of different factors involved. And again, I would see it as a sort of again as a sort of a, a new evolutionary crucible. It's the men mm-hmm. who can sustain testosterone levels despite all this being thrown at them that that that, that part that that, that uh, carry on. This um, all of these changes kind of remind me of the um, the the mouse utopia experiment, uh, the behavioral sink. I don't know if you've if you've had a look at that, but it's um... I've, written, I've written about it. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. I think that's that's right. What happened in that was that so you you, you it was frighteningly um, uh, prescient of what happened to all uh, 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 frighteningly parallel what's happened to humans that the the you have a, essentially the industrial revolution, i.e., the taking away of all of the predation and all of the electric pressures it's a huge spike in population just as you had then um, and then it starts to decline and then you get this odd behavior the women become more masculinized and don't socialize their young properly the, the males um, become don't know how to socialize or they become these beautiful ones these automaton weirdos and um, and uh, and mess up the rest of the colony and eventually nobody has children so yeah I think that's kind of what's happening but we won't get as far as that because there's no John John Calhoun to sustain the utopia we will eventually collapse backwards um however the problem with that is that it doesn't replicate um my colleague has done i'm gonna to have to go to another interview in a minute by the way of course. um uh, uh, my, my colleague has done some research on this and it doesn't seem to replicate and it might be that he it, that mouse utopia thing is a product of uh cherry picking and because mm. there, there, were, there, there were various mouse utopias that he ran and he basically reported on the most interesting one Oh, okay. And there, were, and there were others where it just carried on. They didn't die out. Oh, okay, so, good. Uh, well, let's hope and we're in the second one, <laughs> the one that carried on. <laughs> I suspect um, we are, because as I say, there's no scientist to keep it going, even if we did get to that stage. But it is true. We do have more and more of these autistic weirdos. We do have more and more of these aggressive masculine-like women. I mean, it's very, it's eerily 
uh, the same as what we're seeing. Um, uh, before I let you go, I have one last question to ask you. It's uh, the question of the show. Do you have a um, subversive thinker or a uh, writer or someone that you're inspired by uh, that you think is not getting enough attention from mainstream media? And I can imagine there's a lot of people in genetics that are not getting enough attention. But um, if there's someone that you can recommend to people who are listening a, to this. A, a, a subversive thinker that I'm, um, well, I, I've, all, I've always, I I've was, was originally got into this kind of stuff through the work of Richard Lynn. So I suppose people should, uh, should should read Richard Lynn's stuff more. Uh, he doesn't get that much attention in the mainstream media these days. So um, I, I, I suppose I'd have to say Richard Lynn. Okay, perfect. Um, and in terms of where people can find you, uh, can you let people know what uh, where, where to go to, yes, to see your work? The Jolly Heretic, which is a YouTube channel, um, and it's on uh, and then on BitChute and and, and Odyssey. I put the live streams. I live stream on YouTube, but then I put them on BitChute and Odyssey. Uh, and I live stream once a week on Mondays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. UK time, which is 2 p.m. in New York, and is, I believe 7 p.m. in Romania mm -hmm. as well. Um, and uh, sorry, 9 p.m. in Romania, 9 p.m. in Finland. And 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 uh, and I look at based science and, and and things like that. On Thursdays, I normally interview somebody, so a based scientist or you know, a, a, a scientist that looks at evolutionary psychology, that sort of thing. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Ed. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking to you. It was very entertaining. <laughs> Bye.